Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, got started a couple seconds late. I uh, hope everyone is having a good Friday, y'all. I'm still coming off that conference from the beginning of the week. So hope you all are having a great time today. It's Friday. That I, I don't think I've wanted a Friday more in my life. So please let me know where you are joining us from. I would love to hear that in the chat. Uh, let's see, my LinkedIn people, you know, it always takes us a second to get started. So seeing you now. And with that, I want to bring on my guest, Sean Cannell. He has been, uh, as Amy Landino says, a digital mentor to me. And now we've met in real life, which is awesome. Uh, it's fun when those online things become offline things. So I am so excited for you all to hear Sean's story today, hear about his career. So let me bring Sean on right now. Hello. We're here. We're here, bright and early. I'm fired up. Cool. Um, so first off, I would love for you to explain. I'm actually really interested in the answer to this. What is your current job? What would you, you do for a living? Um, I think my current job is I'm the CEO of a digital media company that helps um, entrepreneurs and leaders build their influence with online video. A way to summarize it, our channel Think Media, if anyone's seen CNET before, if they were researching TVs, like which TV should I buy? We're kind of like the CNET for people that want to create content, videos, and podcasts. Nice. So what does your day-to-day -day look like? Right now, my day-to-day, -day, um, Think Media is a company that has, we, we put out a lot of videos, I think on YouTube weekly. We also have another business called Video Influencers. So every week, um, including our podcast, we're putting out something like five YouTube videos at least. Some of those things will get chopped down and go even further than that. We also have digital education programs to help leaders learn how to maximize their reach. So we update those. There's customer service. Um, we have a monthly membership program. So once a month, fulfilling on that and spending time in the Facebook group. My team right now, uh, I'm based in Vegas. Many of us are here. Some are in LA. Um, is about 15 on the Think Media side and five on the Video Influencer side. And you know, I'm a small town kid. I'm a college dropout, small town kid. Um, and now we're running a multiple seven figure media company or companies really. And so I have no idea what I'm doing, Cass. I'm just, trying, <laughs> I'm just trying <laughs> to figure makes, it out day that makes by me day. Feel better. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't realize there are now 15 people on the team. That's crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really, uh, it's also amazing payroll. Tell you what, but, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. That's, I have a friend who we talk about, and I'm not saying this about, your company, but with that idea of payroll, when people say like, oh, I now have a multi-million dollar business. And we're like, right, but you have a bunch of people. It's not like you took home multi-million dollars. Of course. There's so much that went, like the, it's distributed to people and ads and all the things. So uh, real quick, hi to Chrissy and Rob Alasavis joining us this morning. Thank you for supporting. Hi, Lorena. Um, so, you mentioned college dropout, small town kid. Let's go back to the origin story. What was, and people have interpreted this question differently. So you can take it as your first, first job or first job after like first job of adulthood or just first job. What was that first job? Well, first job, I think is worth talking about because it shaped who I am today. I had Love parents it. who taught me to do the hard thing first. Okay. And as you know, your average teenager who just wants to uh, go hang out with your friends, leave immediately. Um, my parents were the types to say, not until your chores are done. And um, that if you want something, that's fine. You just have to work for it. And um, I remember that really my first main job was mowing lawns. And I'm talking about at scale. Like this is not just like a push mower for your front yard. I then also had riding mowers for bigger fields. I had tractors with mower decks for my dad. We had a separate property where he ran his business and his shop. And so I'm talking like giant tractor mower deck, like covering acres of like high tall grass. And, uh, and then the neighbors, 
at the time too, hired me to mow their lawn. And this was right around when I was 16. And all I wanted was a system. I just wanted, uh, I was, I knew when I was 16, I was going to get my license. I was going to start driving and I needed subwoofers. I wanted a stereo system that I ended <laughs> up, I, I spent like all, I made like two grand during the summer, just spent it all, all on, on subwoofers, amplifiers, so that I could roll up in front of the movie theater in Marysville, Washington, <laughs> boom, boom, you know, and try to flex a little bit. Um, but I look back on that and even to this day, you know, social media can sometimes in being like a YouTuber or like a YouTube creator, people go, that's not really a job. No, it takes hard work, but, but I, I think I pride myself. And one of the things that's given me an edge is just this like hardcore work ethic um, that was really instilled to me by my parents, my dad, my stepdad, Phil Escalin, is a true entrepreneur that would do whatever it takes to to build the company. And so now that same DNA has been passed down to me. You know, fast forward, the second job and the first official government like taxes, they knew I wasn't yeah. made under the table <laughs> job, right. Right. waiting tables at Red Robin. And even though I was then kind of working at a church or volunteering and doing like side video stuff, I was 10 years at Red Robins in Washington state in the corner of the United States, you know, Seattle area. And um, that also, that taught me like service. I, it taught mm -hmm. me kind of humility. I was washing dishes. I was in the bird costume at times. <laughs> I was a busser, I was a waiter. So it caught, <clears throat> taught me customer service, how to talk to people, a lot of things. Um, and it was a good way even making tips to fund the side hustle uh, during that era at times as well. Yeah, no, thank you for talking about that. Cause that's like, we've had Rob on, he's talked about McDonald's taught him a lot. Like I, I think so many of my clients and my viewers who are college age think, oh, those jobs don't mean anything. Like that's just an end to make money to buy the subwoofers, right? Like I'm not really learning anything from it. And no, that, those are the jobs where you learn the customer service that I always tell everyone when you get older, like customer service exists forever. We just get fancy and call them clients, but it's still customer service. And so it's so important to learn those skills. Also, you never know what's going to take you to the next place, like what that weird skill is that will come over with you too. Um, okay, so let's talk then about that first job. like. Or what your goal was, because it's you definitely are a person who pivoted <laughs> very clearly, um, and I would love to talk a little bit about that. So, you were in college, you decided to drop out, going the ministry route. Did you always think that's what you wanted? Did that just kind of fall into place? What was the thought process there? Yeah. So while I was working at Red Robin, my main theme of the early stages, pretty much my whole twenties was being in church ministry. And a lot of times when you're in ministry, you could be, if you will, bivocational. And so in those early days, that first kind of 10 years, I only ever was paid maybe part-time and a low mm -hmm. part-time at that. So that's why I had these other kind of side hustles or ways to make money. Um, I, it was kind of a both and, you know, I went to a year of Bible college in Canada and it wasn't because I thought I was going to be in ministry. But then when I came back to Marysville around Seattle, I started interning at a church. And in 2003, the youth pastor handed me a video camera, hence the theme of video today mm -hmm. and said, Hey, start making video announcements for the youth ministry. Um, and your first videos would be your worst videos. I love that LinkedIn sure. has live now and that videos here and it's just this amazing platform, but you got to put out some bad videos. And I was doing that before even YouTube started or social media really kicked off this is 2003. Right. And I did them weekly. So that also taught me for the first year I did 52 videos because I did them every single week for youth group. Eventually the lead pastor said, Hey, make these on the weekends as well for Sunday. So now I was doing two videos a week. As a volunteer for those first couple of years, 104 plus videos a year. And it was teaching me like the strength to like build my video produ production muscles. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we got to pump out content. And the first YouTube channel we ever started was for our church in 2007. So I felt like I was kind of on two paths. I would say on the one hand, and it's still a major part of my life today, that I was like forging kind of this, my faith and, and even the understanding of ministry being about serving people and helping people. Mm -hmm. Um, while at the same time I was falling in love with video and even in 2007, I started to get clarity that 
I wanted to be on YouTube, that YouTube is this powerful platform to impact people. And that the only way to do that is not just through like a local church, but is also through online. It was the beginnings of, if you will, the internet spreading and social media spreading. So immediately it took me a few years of courage, but I think some of the first YouTube videos I, I posted was 2009 now, two years after we were just posting videos for the church. And even on the side, I was I was watching YouTubers. I ran into the co-author of our book, YouTube Secrets, Benji mm-hmm. Travis. He, we were in the same small town. We grew up in the same small town. So crazy. His wife was doing makeup tutorial. She had like 100,000 subscribers. We ran into each other at the M- YMCA. And I was like, yeah, right, bro. Like in our town, your wife's got 100,000 subscribers. What are you talking about? They hired me doing side work, side pr- uh, video production work. So- um, you know, a lot of it was, I believe this, that like, if you're faithful with what's in your hand, God will give you what's in your heart. Hmm. And so I was in a way just serving. I was in this season and every season I just wanted to do my best. I mean, that's the key to promotion. It's like, if you're just really doing your best today, you really position yourself for a promotion tomorrow. So whether that was in church, whether that was even at Red Robin, and whether that was serving clients, like Benji was one of my first clients, um, and and doing just client work, and all of those pieces, the next big pivot move was the reason I moved to Vegas, where I still live now with my wife, Sonia, was we actually hit a really hard season, and we could talk about that story or not, but like at the end of 2009, my, my wife hit some health challenges, the big short happened, the housing mm-hmm. crash, and um, the church we were part of fell apart as well. Some senior leadership stole some money and all kinds of stuff happened. So uh, we went through kind of a crazy season and and um, learned a lot there. But eventually I moved to Vegas to work at a different church. And that was kind of my first salary career position. Mm-hmm. I moved to Vegas as a director of communications for a larger church, like 3,000 people. Now I'm doing email marketing, Facebook management, helping the pastor manage his personal brand and launch books and and do micro content and content. And I felt like I got my first opportunity to kind of like take this social media thing to another level um, as well as salary and everything like that. And that was the next like five and a half years Um, and just every season trying to to do my best. And and all of that was because of being like the youth pastor handed me a camera and being self-taught, learning social, diving in, rolling up my sleeves. And then even 2010, 11, when we moved to Vegas, it was still super early to be really doing social. Mm -hmm. And so I had sharpened my skills enough that I was positioned to really make a huge jump in my career at the time. Nice. Sorry, by the way, Ted, I know I have a dog in my lap now that I didn't a minute ago. He got, he's very needy today. Um, I love it. So, but I think that's really interesting because- So you actually kind of follow what I teach a lot of uh, people want to figure out their career right now. They want to know, like, what is the thing that I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Just tell me what. And that's where I was like when I was 22. It was like, I've got to figure out at least the industry and just stay in that. And I think what you're showing is what I talk about a lot of. I call it following the gingerbread trail, except it's a better prize at the end than like (laughs) the the wolf at grandma's or whatever, but you don't know where it's ending up. You just take that next thing. You're like, okay, I see this piece of gingerbread. Like, okay, he gave me a camera. I'm going to do something with it. And then that leads to, you know, okay, I'm going to do weekly videos. Now I'm learning production schedules, which is just, it's fascinating to me, like coming from television, hearing people outside be like, yeah, so I figured out my systems. Uh, And then from there, it's, well, okay, then there's email marketing or, oh, now I run in, like Benji is your next piece of gingerbread, but you can't see it all at once. It just, you take that next step, which I find really interesting. 100%. And I think another principle that I learned recently was from my friend, Ken Coleman from like Entree Leadership. He wrote a book called The Proximity Principle. And it was this idea that when you have, some level of clarity about what you want to do in your future, the fastest way to get there is to get in proximity with somebody already doing it. Yep. And therefore, there was things that were kind of being birthed in my heart around 2005, seven, where I started to realize like, I think I, I do want to speak. I think there's some level of like being a speaker. I want to write mm-hmm. a book. I, I, I want to do that. I want to be a communicator for sure. Even video is ultimately speaking. Like we realized right. that 
you don't have to be invited to an event to get on a stage. Yeah. Our common friend and person who works at Think Media, Heather Torres, her YouTube channel, she was just thinking about it. She just had 200 new subscribers, 10,000 views on her channel. She hasn't been uploading videos, but the power of YouTube to like bring you traffic constantly. Right. She's like, I want to be on stages. I just had 10,000 people last month watch my videos. That's a stage. Yep. So anyways, I knew that there was like, I wanted to do these types of things. So that also helped me like the decision to move to Vegas. I was like, wait a minute, I'm going to be around one of a great speaker in the planet. He's been invited to like huge platforms, these larger yeah. churches. He's writing books. I'm going to be able to cut my teeth and learning how to like launch books and, and promote them. And I want to learn all the social media stuff. So now we're going to do Facebook ads and email marketing, but I get to do it in my career. If you, I'm going to get paid to do it, right? paid to learn essentially. Yep. And I'm going to get this opportunity to be around these higher level leaders. So that proximity principle, one other piece to that was even while I had that full-time job, I also would freelance. So I freelanced for a long time for a guy named Dr. Dave Martin. Same thing. He was a success co coach. He's in personal development. I wanted to be around and get to learn from and get to learn on, like through what they were doing, wins and loses, yep. test social media posts on his Facebook page. Oh, that's how reach is working. And all of that cumulative learning was not just even accidental. It was also intentional because I realized it was what I wanted to do in my future, but I was also being patient. I wasn't actually trying to like rush to doing it myself. I wanted to make sure I got all of the nutrients out of the soil of my current season, my current career. And there's maybe a balance of that. You don't want to wait too long and be afraid of right. jumping out. But at the same time, I wanted to make sure that like, I really had the chops. I really had the experience. I really knew my stuff. And now we like teach social media. I go deep. I mean, as you, I mean it's like, yeah. there's, there's a real richness to the years right. uh, and different projects and people I've worked with when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. And I love that you talked about proximity principle because I I teach that all the time. The beauty is now with LinkedIn, you can have proximity without being close. But even still, I work with a lot of people who want to work in entertainment. I'm in Orange County and I have students who will say, oh, I want to work in Hollywood. And they'll say I drive, they drive Uber. And I'm like, why are you not up by Paramount and Netflix just circling those buildings? And a student took me up on it. And he saw me last week and said, just got to say thank you. Like, I went up to Hollywood. I did what you said. Producer got in my car. He's had PA work for like six months. Like he's having a hard time finishing his degree because he's getting so much work. And I'm like, that's a different version of what you're talking about. But it's the same thing. It's be where the people are that are doing what you want to do. And sometimes that's an actual location. Sometimes that's finding like one or two people, but that's it's a brilliant amazing. strategy, by the way. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, that will be coming out. I have a video coming soon of my weirdest career advice, and that one is in it. Um, I do see questions from people. Uh, Dakari, I'm going to go with you first. Uh, so he wanted to know from you, how did you juggle freelancing YouTube and family life while you were building your business? What would you have done differently looking back at things now? Great question. I think um, one huge piece of our career has been that um, I don't have kids yet. And that's maybe something a lot of people can relate to. But at, on the other hand, uh, I also, I grew up, you know, in this like conservative church environment and whatnot. And we got married super young. I married, I got married 21 uh, to my wife. She was 21. And a lot of our peers were getting married at like 19, 20, 21. And let's be honest. I mean, again, conservative church kids, we, we were just doing that because we wanted to have sex. I mean, it was really the culture of, of like, uh, Thank you for the honesty, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, but it was, it, it was, it was literally like the culture. So for good or bad, cause that could have led to, uh, all kinds of things, but all that to say we got married young, but all of my friends, like all of them got pregnant, like instantly, uh, we did it. And, um, that, that, I mean, so I think that's a, that's a huge one because you go into, it doesn't mean you still can't build a business and hustle, but, uh, I principle number one was, you know, we have this, my wife and I had this comp, uh, we're as a couple didn't have kids. So we were able to really go all in on building our career, if you will. And even just living our life together. I think number two is making sure you get whoever it, you have to ask, do you have dependents? Do you have a spouse? Who do you have? And, uh, being unified around that. So what's amazing about Sonia, my wife, is she 
believed in me. She believed in the vision. She believed in the hustle that I was doing. And that I believe that you can't burnout is if you sacrifice always and you burn the candle at both ends forever. Mm -hmm. But I believe there's always a sacrifice season that leads to success and mm -hmm. you can do anything for a season. So, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I'll break it down Dakari. <laughs> this for a season, uh, Monday was like my day off to do homework while I was doing in this internship and I'd run, I'd lead a small group at night. Then Tuesday, I would have school that started at 6 a.m., this little Bible college. I'd be done by like nine and then I would spend the rest of the day getting ready, shooting and editing videos for youth group on Wednesday. We gave our whole day on Wednesday to uh, the church and so mm -hmm. it was all day long. Uh, and then we do youth ministry at night. Thursday, I had school in the morning and then I would double at Red Robin. And that would happen on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So I'd work around 35 hours, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 32 to 35, set up and tear down church. A lot of times I would edit video all night long after working at Red Robin Saturday night and then and then church all Sunday morning. Then I would die Sunday afternoon yeah. and sleep. And then I'd get up and try to like do homework and anything I needed to do. Now that was a little too intense. And even yeah. when we look back, the first couple of years of marriage were terrible. But one of the mm -hmm. reasons why was because I was a jerk, but number two was because there was no margin. But I just, I guess I mean that when we look back now, like we gave up our twenties to position ourselves for like living this like business built around our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Like, so, I mean, it was a ton of sacrifice. So how do you juggle? I mean, you literally just juggle. And I think we just put in a ton of hustle. When I look back, what I would have done differently is I don't think I would have sacrificed my health as much. I did develop a little bit of RSI, like repetitive stress injury, mm -hmm. like programmers get it from editing so much yeah. all night, not taking breaks. You feel invincible in your early 20s. And all through my 20s, I edited so much video for such long stints. That's kind of like tennis elbow. And yeah. uh, thank God I have editors and stuff today. But like, so I, I think that there, I went a little too far. And I also, towards the end of my 20s, I was no longer exercising, I was sitting, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, it was, you know, different things like that. So you look back and I would have applied a little bit more of wisdom in those seasons. Sonia, excuse me, Sonia and I had this um, um, incredibly unified the entire time because she's like, I, I believe in where we're going and, and now yeah. we're here. And um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, balance, I think, can be a myth. There was not a balanced season, mm -hmm. but now we actually are living pretty dang balanced. Like sleep is super important. Exercise is a staple in my life and uh, eating well and hustling really hard, but also resting hard and, and learning those rhythms. Now I'm 36. And so, yeah, when you're young and you can grind, I mean, I, I set me up for the future. So it was like a pretty insane level of work ethic, ethic for like a decade. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I people ask me, they're like, "Well, wow, you're how do you do all of it?" I'm like, "I'm I'm single. <laughs> I don't know. Like, there's there's some extra time there. Like, one hundred percent makes it easier. Sorry. Um, so okay, Anna had a great question because this leads to something else we need to talk about. Are there any differences with someone starting a YouTube channel in 2008 versus today? What is needed to begin? Of course. I mean, in 2008, that was three years after the platform started. It was nowhere near as, as if you will, crowded. Um, it was also nowhere near as developed. Like there mm -hmm. was issues, like sometimes people like videos would not go out to subscribers and like mm -hmm. bugs on the platform. But um, you had that first mover advantage. I will say this, um, and don't even take this the wrong way, but when a platform starts um, and is brand new, like TikTok right now, even like LinkedIn right now, like I know it's not just starting, but content publishing is still really early here and organic reach is amazing. In fact, um, the algorithm is favoring new creators uh, on LinkedIn. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to be a fast mover right now. We're a fast, like we're doing our best posting content every single day on LinkedIn, like videos every single day on LinkedIn. And so um, when a platform starts, if you're first, you can win. But when a platform matures, you got to be best to win. Hmm. And what I mean by that is again, you're like, oh shoot. Well, it's there's already too many good people. It's already too crowded. I simply right. mean though that you're just not going to get away with not having a clear vision, with not putting out quality content. I don't mean production value, like your lighting's amazing and you have the best right. microphone. I just mean that like you got to put out something, you got to know who your target audience is, what problem you solve for them, and show up consistently with valuable content for them. And you got to do it over a long period of time. Like you could pop on 
TikTok instantly right now on on with less content period, you could actually have some breakout moments on YouTube uh, maybe early on. Now your breakout moments still happen, but YouTube is a marathon and not a sprint. For so sure. I would honestly say you got to commit to posting 35 to 55 videos <clears throat> before the algorithm even really gets seasoned. And here's what's really cool. My friend Roberto Blake says it this way. Um, there's no crowds on the extra mile. Something like that. I probably mm -hmm. completely slaughtered it. Basically saying that on YouTube, because of that fact, most people aren't going to get to 55 videos. Mm -hmm. And you're a great example of this. You you started and, and didn't experience a lot for a lot of uploads and even mm -hmm. like over a year. But now your channel's popping off. 43,000 right. subscribers, views, breakout videos. So I think you knew your who, you knew your what, you were clear, you were consistent, and you showed up adding value. There's 2020 is amazing. There's a, a tons of opportunity on YouTube, but it is different. And it takes yeah. a greater level of clarity, strategy, and consistency to break through on link on uh, YouTube right now. Yeah, no, I agree. Because I think it's the, the, what I tell everybody from my experience is show up when no one is watching, just keep showing up, even though no one is watching. Like, if as long as you know, you're putting out good content, like, I knew my advice was right. And I get I've already gotten two emails this morning from people saying they got jobs. So I know it works. It just took a while to get found, you know? Um, and I think also what's that quote of like the best time to be on the platform is at the beginning. The second best time is now it's like, just do it. It's not going to get less competitive in a year. So to me, if you want to do it, go do it. 100%. Yeah. The best time to plant a tree was five years ago. The second best time is today mm -hmm. or yeah. something like that. Right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I think, um, yeah, I couldn't be more excited about YouTube and here's maybe another way to look at it. I just did a video, like, is it too late to start YouTube in 2020? And I mentioned at least 10 examples of people that have started within the last year, if not the last six months. And there's, and then sometimes they're growing very rapidly mm -hmm. as well. So, um, it's as great a time as any, but I think having the right strategy and being clearer on exactly how you're going to break out is essential. Whereas a lot, there was a lot of, I'll put it this way, accidental success happening yeah. early on YouTube. Now you just need to be intentional and strategic about breaking through. That makes sense. Um, yeah, the TikTok thing. Oh, we could talk. I did my first TikTok dance last night. It was terrible. Uh, we put it up there. Um, Okay, can we talk a little bit about, there was one other thing you did that I think people find really interesting uh, when you were in that like ministry life, freelancing on the side, you also did affiliates. Can we talk about affiliates for a minute? Yeah, so the reason I was so attracted to YouTube over all the social media platforms is that YouTube is the only platform where your content lives forever. Mm -hmm. This is what I mean. YouTube is a search engine. Therefore, if you make a good video that's optimized well, then that video can get views for weeks, months, and even years later after you posted it. The reason that was attractive to me was when you have a side hustle, you have to be very intentional about your time. So any platform, mm -hmm. say, for example, even like Instagram stories, LinkedIn stories are coming out, like that's mm -hmm. a thing. Mm -hmm. Then that means that every day, though, 24 hours, stories expire. You have to get up, you know, grab your phone, produce content, and then start over the next day. It's cool. There's opportunity there. But I thought, well, if I only have limited time, and maybe if I can't even create content every week, which was the early days of Think Media and my personal channel, I might only be able to create uh, three videos now, but I, then it's three months of being too busy and having too much client work or too many. Mm -hmm. It's Easter at church, like, you know, like crazy. <laughs> so like knowing that I'm going to have these different rhythms um, I got obsessed with figuring out how to rank videos, which simply means optimizing a video so that when someone types in a search in YouTube, they find the video. And an example is like one of the first videos I did was called gift ideas for him. And I was like, okay, so people are searching for gift ideas for a husband or a boyfriend or, a, you know, some kind mm -hmm. of a man in their life. And they're looking for these gift ideas. I I've now been studying and even taking courses and going to conferences, whatever I'm learning about how to rank videos. And so I put that video out. It still ranks today. So if you type in mm -hmm. gift ideas for him Thank on YouTube, you. it shows up like number four, five, or six. It has almost a million views. And then what I learned about, you mentioned affiliate marketing, where you could sign up for a website like amazon.com. 
And anything that you talk about on that website, you get a custom link. And if someone clicks that link and makes a purchase, you get paid. And so I just went around my house and grabbed like headphones and some books and like a watch and like maybe guys will like this stuff. I'm a guy, didn't even mm -hmm. buy anything new, sat down on my couch. It was like, hey, here's some gift ideas for him. You could get him like headphones, you could get him this. And if you wanna check this stuff up, there's links in the description below. So then when people click on those links and they make a purchase, I started to make money on the side, like online income. Mm -hmm. And you know, my first ever affiliate check though, was two dollars and twelve cents. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, time now to retire. They won't, even, they won't even send it to you for that little amount of money. <laughs> sure, and tell I don't actually know if they sent it to me. I think yeah, I still I had it to hit the hundred dollar threshold. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. just my first dollar, uh, my first month. And so, um, you know, it didn't start out super sexy, but I I realized I was like, all this needs to do is scale because two mm -hmm. could become twenty. And this last month, we made twenty thousand dollars off of profit off of the Amazon affiliate program alone. And that's just one of over 10 income streams yeah. that we now have developed out in our businesses in our businesses. So all that to say, though, is I started to double down on that. I did other gift ideas videos, but then I got clarity that I was like, wait a minute, I really have people were asking me a lot of advice about what camera how to use their camera. I've been doing video since 2003. So that was kind of the genesis of Think Media. I started doing tech product reviews. What lighting should you use? What camera? What lenses? How do you use your camera? And I would put these videos out. And so the power of this, YouTube plus affiliate marketing, was that even with freelance clients or even with a busy schedule working at the church, I started to make 100 bucks a month, 250 a month, as much as $500 a month as total side income mm -hmm. that actually was completely passive because maybe during the summer I'd make some videos or during holiday break, but then I would take months off, but these videos would still generate a little bit of income. And that also was helping me build up my side hustle. Um, meaning that while I was working on my day job, I was chipping away at my dream job. And when I stepped out in 2015 to go full on in entrepreneurship, Think Media had 16,000 subscribers and I was generating probably 500 bucks a month on the side, the principle there is that I didn't like start at zero, like, mm -hmm. okay, you know what? I'm just gonna go all in and see if this, I actually had proven viability. So now it was just a matter of adding momentum to that, mm -hmm. uh, that income. And that's initially what I did after, after I was actually lost three of my freelance clients, October, 2015, they all fired me. And mm -hmm. so that's a whole story. But uh, that was the kick off the cliff into entrepreneurship where I just went all in mm -hmm. um, in in doing YouTube and like tech reviews and Black Friday, best tech on Black Friday. Mm -hmm. And by January 2016, um, we were making something like 4,300 or so a month off of the Amazon affiliate program, another 500 or so off of YouTube ads. And so it was like a 60K a year at the start of entrepreneurship for my wife and I. And then we started Great. scaling from there and building out other income streams in our business. Yeah. To me, I just feel like if anyone has any sort of platform where you're allowed to put a link in to that, like it takes five minutes to sign up for Amazon affiliate. Now, granted, if you don't sell enough the first couple of times, you got to go reapply, whatever. But like um, Magic Links, all those places, it... To me, I just go, it can't hurt. If I make an extra 10 bucks, that's one and a half coffees at this point. My gosh. Uh, but it's something, you know, it's it's money that you didn't have before. So I think it's always worth it. So Lauren asked, how do you get yourself initially involved with different brands so that you're able to add their link in your videos? Do you mind explaining that a little bit? Sure. So yeah, one of the challenges of... Um of affiliate marketing initially is getting approved. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people, they apply for Amazon, they get denied or they get approved and they need to make enough sales in a certain number of days. They don't, they get kicked out of the program. So at Video Influencers, our, our tagline, which is a weekly interview show we do on YouTube with people crushing it with video, is helping you build your influence, income, and impact with online video. That order is really important because influence, I believe, precedes income, which mm -hmm. precedes impact. And sometimes people don't agree with me, but I'm like, look, if you don't have income and you can't keep the lights on or you're, you can't even pay for your internet connection, it's going to be hard to impact people online. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to influence anyone uh, or, or to make any kind of, so you need to generate, but before you make income, you need actually influence. Like if zero people are watching your stuff. Right. So for like a YouTube standpoint, but it could be any platform. It could be your blog. 
I suppose, I don't even know what LinkedIn's policy, if you like wrote an article and you put affiliate links in it. Um, I don't know. I've thought about trying that. <laughs> like that's an interesting, but you, you need some sort of level of readership. So from a YouTube standpoint, I typically recommend, it almost doesn't matter what your subscribers are. I recommend you're getting at least about 200 views a video. Mm -hmm. This means that there's like enough people there. And then that you do a few strategic videos that are directly related to affiliate marketing, meaning this, their intent in watching the video is probably to make a purchase. So in your case, if you were giving like tips on interview questions, they're watching that their intent is not to buy a product. But if you were to review, uh, let's, I don't know if this is true, but like monster.com, which is like a job placing or job place, right? I don't right. know if it's still around. And like another site like it. And you were like monster versus the other site. Both of those platforms might have affiliate programs. You get right. a referral fee if you send somebody that uses their service because that's how they make money. So if you say like best, you know, monster versus whatever, and you say, by the way, if you want to check out these services, I think monster is better, but both are good. Links in the description below, 200 views per video, good chance that the intent in watching a versus video like that, in my case, to be even more clear, Canon M50, which is a camera versus the Canon M6 Mark II. If you're even watching that video, you're probably about to buy a camera. Like you're, totally. as opposed to <clears throat> like seven weird facts about right. the rock. You're like, well, you're not about to make a purchase. So regarding your blog, your email, your podcast, you wanna make sure you got a little bit of viewership and then you wanna make sure you put out some strategic content. This is specifically for Amazon. So not only when you get approved and you apply, but you also make enough sales to get locked mm -hmm. into the program. Mm -hmm. um, that's really how I would start. Yeah, yeah, just for everyone out there, I failed at the Amazon group twice. I, third time was the charm. Uh, I don't know, I think maybe I didn't have quite a big enough audience the first time. But then on the flip side, uh, with my <clears throat> basically defunct beauty channel, uh, I had, I think, 12 subscribers. I was probably getting 20 views a video. And I did a Nordstrom anniversary sale. So very timely, very relevant, very on trend for that Nordstrom anniversary sale, what I bought video and uh, did the links. And y'all, I almost didn't do it. I was like, if the sales three days in, everybody's done a video already, who cares? It had a thousand views in a day. And when I woke up the next morning, I had made $16. So kind of like you and your tutor, I was like, I made $16. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> so it is, it is possible. I feel like you should, if there's the chance to have a link, like it makes sense with the video, to me, I say put the link even if you don't have the audience because it could be that one person. But you're right. It's not going to generate like actual income until you have that influence first. That's right. Yeah. Um, Y'all, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments. And Dan, good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Dan's been on the show. Um, Sean, what advice do you have to the 20 something who's just starting out in their career? Man, if you're 20 and just starting out in your career, I would say, um, you know, go hard. I would, I would go back to the proximity principle. I would say, um, try to get as clear as possible. Okay. A couple things. First of all, um, get clear on what it is you want to do in your life. But if you're in your twenties, you might not have any clue. I think step mm -hmm. one is just like, do a lot. Like just start doing stuff and don't be afraid if like the first move you make is not the thing you love. You want to try and taste a lot of different things. One of the cool things about uh, volunteering and being at the church was in youth ministry, I was learning, if you will, like really people skills. That's kind of like the more pastoral role, like meeting with people, coffee with people, talking mm -hmm. to people. I was learning like event planning. Um, you know, serving on a weekend on a church, there's like, there's kids ministry. I learned, okay, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> that's not the age group. You know, right. uh, I was learning speaking. I learned video editing. I was so, so I got my hands on a lot of different things, which helped me define what I didn't want to do. And I think it's okay to start something and learn, okay, that's not what I really ultimately want to oh, do. Yeah. You're learning self-awareness. So I think first one, test and try a lot of different things to try to learn kind of what it is you want to do. I started to get clear okay, I like communicating. I like speaking. So let me double down on that. I like video. Let me double down on that. Then the next move would be, I think proximity principle at some time would be, how can you now go intern for, get around, learn from 
uh, someone doing exactly what you want to do at potentially mm -hmm. a high level. And I think you be, you could become at a crossroads. I think in your 20s, you could be too fixated on trying to get the best salary possible, the best benefits possible, but potentially in a job you hate. If it's a job you love and it's your mm -hmm. dream and it's your calling, cool. But like, don't try to cash in uh, in your 20s, in my opinion, even if you were to have to go work for lower pay or even work for free, drive Uber, but start like getting some Hollywood gigs, that's going to get you closer to what you ultimately love. Right. So that's what I would also spend my 20s doing. I I think people have different motivations and I don't think being motivated by money is inherently bad, but it, what's I think what's it's powerful for that to be nowhere near your number one motivation. Mm -hmm. Like for me, being motivated more by purpose, motivated more by happiness, motivated more by wanting to do something that I love and realizing that money will come in time. And it certainly has motivated by mastery and wanting to uh, hone and sharpen my skills. And um, so that's what I do in my 20s. And, and then I think the last thing is that in your 20s, you could feel you, you might look ahead and you see this guy with gray hair, you know, 36, like, dude, you're, you're old. Um, and, but, but you, I feel, you know, like my career is literally just getting started. I just, Ben Affleck's mm -hmm. got a new movie coming out and he was recently actually talking at a church called Mosaic in LA. He's talking about how he's 46 and they were talking about all his movies and his career. And I thought, dude, 46, that's a decade from now. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, I'm going to wreak some havoc in the next decade. I was like, this is where I'm at right now. I was like, come on next 10 years, you know? And, and so it kind of was giving me perspective, like whatever the body of work it is you want to create, whatever, you know, the portfolio you want to build, whatever the LinkedIn profile you envision, mm -hmm. what, what you want on your resume, like just remembering that you got time. So if you're in your twenties, just put in the work, develop the skills, build the relationships and try to avoid being worried about cashing in too soon. That'll help mm -hmm. with relationships too. build your network with zero expectation, build your network, adding value, not trying to extract value. And so many things I made a ton of mistakes in my twenties, but I did a lot of things right. Positioning me for really where I am today. Nice. No, I love that. Um, there was something you said in there that I wanted to come back to but I was looking at comments. Uh, no, the going back to what you said, I mean, first off, I loved all of it, but going back to that first part about find out what you don't like, that is so important. And people want to make the right move all the time. It's like, I've got to make the right decision. It's got to be the best choice. And I tell people all the time, like, no, sometimes the best choice is like, I want students to take that internship that they thought was their dream and find out they freaking hate it so that we can set it aside and try the other three things they thought were interesting, you know? So I think finding what you don't like is just as important. So I love that you brought that up. Um, really, really well yeah. put. And that leads to like, that even in what you like, there might be a lot of things you don't like. So yeah. I started to realize like, I love video, but I remember one time I got a little side project where I drove down to Bellevue and I started editing for like kind of more traditional production that was kind of more like buttoned up, corporate commercials mm -hmm. and they sat me down at a booth and said edit this video and i did it for about two days made a few dollars per hour and then i was like i freaking hate this like mm -hmm. this is because the difference between like creative weird run and gun youtube content is way different than like buttoned up corporate commercials yep. so i was like okay this is not something i love i did a few wedding videos when i started my business clear vision media in 2009 and I realized I they would gave me too much stress. Some people love doing them, but I was like, what if I miss the kiss? Da, da, da. There's so much editing. And, and yeah. so it just, I learned it wasn't my favorite thing. I had fun doing a couple, but I was like, that's not what I want to do forever. So even as a video editor, and even in knowing that I love video, it was a it was certain types of video. I, mm -hmm. I and then I started getting into like interviews and stuff because I realized lifelong leaders or lifelong learners. I love learning, I love getting around other experts. Iron sharpens iron, sharpen the saw. And so I, uh, I started to dr like then get even clarity within my specific, if you will, career yep. about the nuances. <clears throat> and so, yeah, taste and try a lot. And then don't be afraid to try to continually pivot towards uh, that next thing. And one kind of caution that I think I've learned that that maybe this here's the old guy talking down to the Zoomers, <laughs> this boomer talking to the Zoomers Gen is, uh, is I do think, though, that there's something powerful about staying planted 
in mm. careers and things that you don't love as much because it really does develop character. So just mm. as soon as you realize you don't love something, you don't necessarily, you know, maybe start transitioning, but don't just bail on mm -hmm. maybe your current career or job, or maybe there's still a lot you need to learn. Like to say that during that season, there was maybe even years or multiple years of things I didn't love the most, but I believe that there was things I needed to learn and I wanted to have some, you know, consistency and some longevity. I mean, working at 10 Rob Red Robin for 10 years is like unheard of. Like, yeah. what the heck? And obviously I was doing other things, but I learned so much and got so much out of that. That kind of taught me about consistency and loyalty, which I kind of believe how you do anything is how you do everything. And who you become in your 20s is going to really shape who you are in your 30s as well. And so I think there, yeah, I mean, I just think there's something that I, I, it's okay to jump. Of course, it's okay to leave a job, but if you're just known for just jumping around jumping all the around, time yeah. and bailing instantly, that may not be the career and reputation you ultimately want to build. Yeah, no, I agree. I tell people all the time, cause I've had to do this in positions of, it's very easy to just go, Oh, I don't like this job. Well, why don't you like it? There's, it's probably not the overall job. It could be a toxic boss. It could be, you like what you do. Uh, so working in higher ed, I realized the school, I love the school I'm at now, but the school I did grad school at, there was a point where I went, I don't like this. And I had to really figure out what part I didn't like. And it was, <clears throat> they're not going to like me for this, but it was the type of, it just, I realized the type of institution it was, wasn't the right fit for me. It wasn't a bad school. It wasn't, uh, they're ranked as one of the highest employers in higher ed. Like they're great but it wasn't the right fit for me. So when I went to look for the post-grad school job, I knew I'm gonna try and stay away from this type of place. But it's very easy uh, to hit a point in places where you go, oh, I just don't like it. Like there's actually, there's some nuances to that. And I think sometimes when you get into those, when you start dissecting it, you realize whether you should stay and work through the uncomfortable or if it's just toxic and it's time to go. I think there are places and times for both, but a lot of times now we, yeah, people just go, okay, I'm out. Um, Emily Fisher, I'm going to answer your, what if you're in your thirties question? Emily, you can change your mind. That's what I would always go tell my 22 year old self is you can change your mind at 31. I realized I didn't want to be in entertainment anymore. And similar to what Sean said about looking at Ben Affleck, I realized I could go back to school for two years to get my master's and I could still be three jobs in 10 years from now and be at a higher level 10 years from now. So there's, I feel there is always more time to try something new um, because you go through this life once. So you shouldn't be miserable along the way. Uh, and if you've been in customer service 10 years, no, that's not bad. So Lauren asked a question too, and we'll wrap up on this. Thank you for giving your time this morning. Bright and early. You didn't even get to do, Sean, you didn't even get to do your rise and grind yet. I watched. It's not even up there yet. My gosh. Um, if you don't follow Sean on Insta stories every morning, <laughs> coffee, rise and grind. Rise and grind. Um, so this is kind of a heavy question, but I know you can handle it. Uh, so Lauren asked, did you have less time to invest in your relationships with family and friends in your 20s for the sake of creating the foundation of your career? And if so, how did you make peace with that? You know, I that's a it's a pretty subjective question yes. because it's hard to quantify and hard to define. Um, you know, I think it also is maybe even somewhat personality based. Sure. I'm an I'm an only child. My parents are remarried, so I have three siblings. Never really lived with any of them. Um, was always kind of like a head down, uh, stay focused type of guy, anyways. So I think about that. But you know, for most of our twenties, we're living right by my parents, and so my wife has incredible relationship with her parents. I have incredible relationship with my parents. Again, my siblings, pretty good relationship with them, but they were already like in New York, and and we would we'd get together. We were making all the major holidays. I developed incredible relationships. I think actually one of the signs of a pretty healthy life is long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. I just went, uh, that original youth pastor that handed me a video camera and had me start editing video. 
just launched uh, a brand new church. Now he's a lead pastor in Oceanside, California. It's called Rhythm Church. Went to the opening, met up with some of those original interns. Mm -hmm. We're still connected. But I mean, saying all that, I actually, so I think about it, I think about a lot of my relationships I've now had my, my, uh, one of my best friends, Kevin Davidson, I met at, at in Canada and then he married an American and now he lives here with a couple of kids. Now he lives in Vegas. Mm. And so I've got, uh, I, I mean, I feel like my life, I'm just <clears throat> blessed. I think that true wealth is, has a lot to do with relationships. I think mm -hmm. true wealth has a lot to do with peace in your soul and, uh, you know, things that are not just, of course, not just money. So I think that, um, I feel amazing and, and I, and I feel like, no, but maybe by some people's observation, they might think like, you know, they have a, a quotient of spending way more time because I'm also, maybe this is a guy thing, or maybe it's just a me thing. Um, with some of my best friends, we can go four months not talking. And then we all of a sudden are together and like grabbing drinks and dinner somewhere and catching up. Um, and with my parents, sometimes we'll go through a seasons of hanging out a lot. And, and, and then we'll go through a time where I do, this reminds me, I should call my mom. Like, you know, like, whatever. <laughs> like it's, been a, it's been a while. So, yeah. so I, I think that, uh, yeah, there's nothing that I need to make peace with. Yeah. Um, that, and I could see that there, what I do, I will say this, one of my highest values is you should never sacrifice the things that matter most on the altar of success. I think yeah. that your priorities are way out of whack. If, I don't want to have built a big business and built a big bank account and have my wife hate me, my family not know me. I believe that success at the end of your life, as defined by John Maxwell, the leadership coach and author I've taken for myself, is that at the end of my life, I want the people closest to me to love and respect me the most. Mm -hmm. What kind of a guy are you? What kind of a girl were you? What kind of you know, and were you just like, you could turn it on on camera, but then you were a total jerk to be around and live with. Right. And so um, I'm not, I, I fall short and probably go to the extreme of, of again, being just kind of driven. Like, I, I don't want to hang out with people that much anyways. Like I'm, I'm kind of an introvert. <laughs> I need to be alone and locked in yeah. a room and chill out. And after social media marketing world, we were just hanging out. Oh. I need to decompress. Oh, so, I spent I spent Wednesday on the couch, just like, please, nobody, I can't, I can't Don't do talk it. To I me. get it. Yes. Yeah. Cause we were around hundreds of people yes. like 24 seven for a couple of yes. days. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, and, and, and again, seasons now, uh, we're, we're, I would also say, you know, because of the lifestyle we've created, my wife and I've been talking a lot about it, you know, our parents are going to be around forever and they're, they're in the yeah. like upper sixties or young, but, uh, yeah. We're, but now we're making, we're being intentional and we right. have resource to do what we want, when we want, where we want with the people that right. matter most to us. We're business owners, so we can, uh, cr we've created a life on our own terms. So, you know, recently I took my mom, I take her on date days, you know? Um, and again, some people may be like, I don't know, I, maybe they want to hang out with their family every single night. It might be like two months before I talk to her, but then we spend like a couple days together we right. are able to do things together. So, I mean, I think it's about self-awareness, knowing your own rhythms, but I think that family is always and forever a priority. There's maybe seasons where, again, you sacrifice a little bit to set you up for the future. But this last year, my grandfather passed away mm -hmm. on my dad's side and, and those types of things. And, um, can also always remind you that we don't have forever. So making sure we have those cherished moments, those, those times with family is really key. Yeah, no, and I agree. I don't think, I think I, Lauren, like there is the idea of uh, if it's time, and I don't think you meant this as pointed as it may have come across, uh, Lauren, but time doesn't always mean like quality, right? And so sometimes it's, it's like you said, it's dinner once a month and texts every day or, you know, also, I think having that conversation, if it is a season of sacrifice, having that conversation with family and friends of what you're going through um, and why you maybe aren't around as much, but if they still matter. So I think it can just kind of depend on the situation. And yes, everybody's family situation is different. I have friends who they hang out with their like extended family all weekend, 
every weekend. And I'm like, that's, that's just not my family. We're, th- we're fine, but that's yeah, not my family. So that's not my family either. Are. Yeah. And, and actually probably to an unhealthy extreme with my stepdad being a, an entrepreneur and my mom even being like pretty independent. Mm-hmm. We, I remember I look back, we like, didn't really go on vacations like, oh, okay. like growing up and we would some, you know, we'd, we'd some spend some time together, but like, again, he was building the business. So that's maybe the, if you will, maybe unhealthy extreme, I'd say this, I'm going the opposite of that. Like Sony and I took four, over four weeks off last year. Awesome. So for the level people see my grind and it's, it's a mm-hmm. legitimate grind. Cause when yes, I'm working, I'm working like, I mean, and I, and I'll put in long days and whatnot, but also I don't know a lot of people that maybe took four weeks off with probably another four weeks of pretty lifestyle based business activities totally. that are a, a joy to, you know, so, so you don't necessarily always see the whole picture, but Again, my parents like they're not calling me either. Like they're still <laughs> kind of that same. They're kind of like I'm not like denying right. their calls. They're kind of they're they're busy. They're like head down. So I'm actually kind of correcting a little bit, saying no. We're going. We're actually we actually uh, you know when we move into the season of of having a family or kids, which we don't have yet. Um, my my choice, my decision as a leader, as a father, is going to be. I want them to see the hardcore work ethic. I believe work is a blessing. But then I also want them to see uh, fun, rest, and a healthy balance of mm-hmm. run hard and rest hard. And so that's kind of what we want to pioneer. It's a little bit of, it's you get so much of what you're handed and what's been passed on to you. I've got friends, totally. right, of all different backgrounds and all different cultures. Sometimes it's a cultural thing. Oh, we kind of sure. do like where, right. again, it's everyone's always, you're always hanging out with the cousins and like everybody yeah. else. And, yep. and, and even if you have like seven siblings or something, again, I just have a couple of step siblings and Couples in New York and some are in Oak Harbor. My sister lives in Vegas, and even her, actually, her being here, yeah, I'll see her. We we get coffee or dinner, like you know, once a. Sean, month all or... my family's in Orange County. I saw them at Christmas. Like it just, yeah. it's it's Depends. how it happens. It's different. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Okay. Well, thank you. We're gonna wrap up there because I know, like, you have things to do today. I have things to do. Everybody else does too. Thank you so much, everyone, to join uh, for joining. Sean, thank you for being here. I super appreciate it. Uh, where can people, I think most people on here know, but where can people find you? Yeah. Uh, Sean Cannell, as you see on the screen on all platforms at Sean Cannell, would love to connect Twitter, LinkedIn, um, add me on there and, uh, uh, Instagram. And then, you know, I think a great resource for people, if you're interested in YouTube and you want to learn about it, our book, YouTube secrets, Mm -hmm. um, we got an audio book. That's one of my favorite things. Do you like audio books? Okay, I'm I'm not your customer on that, but I read the regular. But I'm not. You read the regular. You're not an audio book. Yeah. Okay, well, but well I know we what everybody all. else is. So. We got physical ebook, audio book, but a lot of people. Whether you want to commute, drive to work, whatever, um, it's it's a pretty quick read, and it'll give you the overview. I would say this. I think, and I get, we got a lot of things to juggle. I think, though, as any leader, business, or brand, or entrepreneur, it is irresponsible to be ignoring YouTube, mm. second largest search engine second most visited website in the world, number one video platform in the world. And guess what? It is free to use. Mm -hmm. The only barrier to entry on YouTube, you got a phone, you got an internet connection, is hustle, is strategy. And and if you're a higher level business leader, well, then you ignoring YouTube is you devoting the resources or the team, the time or the money, not even necessarily the time. Or if you're, uh, you know, you got a side, side hustle and you wanna build your business, build a nonprofit, build something on the side, YouTube is just too powerful. There's too much potential. There's over 2 billion monthly active users, your target customers, the movement you want to start. YouTube, I believe, is still the best platform to do that on. And mm-hmm. so YouTube Secrets, the book, is a good, a, good, a good way to get kind of an overview as well as get clarity about the action you could take personally and how YouTube might really help you build your influence, your income, so you can ultimately make a greater impact with whatever it is you are doing in life. So check that out and uh, grateful for having me on the show and uh, just love what you're doing. And uh, it's really powerful. It's helping a lot of people. I am impressed with you, your show, you. your YouTube channel, your brand and everything that you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. And y'all YouTube secrets is already in the description box. So, and on LinkedIn, it should be in the in the post. So you can get that there. We'll also learn about that whole affiliate thing with uh, LinkedIn from that one too. So thank you, Sean, for joining. Thank you everyone for being here. Have a great day. Bye.